an encouragement of citizen involvement. Membership's open to anyone that supports our mission, and uh, we welcome anyone to join us. This is our last regular meeting of the year. We'll uh, start up again in September, but we do have our annual meeting for members uh, Thursday, June the 10th, and I encourage you all to become members. Uh, we just found out today that our keynote speaker will be Justin Barkley. So if you're a Justin Barkley fan, join the Patriots and you can come to our annual meeting and it'll be a great time. We have a lot planned. Uh, it's going to be right here at the church. Yeah, you know, we meet here because the usual place we met will us have 25 people. It looks like the Akaba wouldn't fit in there tonight. And if you've been to our meetings recently, we get to have a pretty full house. We have about 350 people at our last meeting. So 25 doesn't cut it. So Pastor Bart and the folks here at Lighthouse have been very generous. And this is where we meet because a lot of people want to come to the meetings. And they also want to breathe free. We don't. Uh, you can wear a mask here, but don't ask us to. We, <coughs> we actually read books and we know the science, <laughs> unlike our politicians just pretend to. And that's what this topic is about tonight. Uh, we have a treat for you. Uh, we added uh, a couple folks uh, tonight uh, that are just going to be here briefly, but to give us an update, uh, a lot of us, how many people have had lunch, breakfast at Marlena's Bistro. Raise your hand. Well, we're going to get a little update tonight from Marlena and uh, her attorney, Robert Baker. And I'm first going to introduce uh, Robert Baker. He's a United States Army veteran. He's a Western Michigan University graduate, go Broncos, with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and Accounting and a Thomas M. Cooley Law School graduate with a Juris Doctorate. He was admitted to the Michigan Bar in 1997, and he's also admitted in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in federally and western and eastern districts of Michigan and the United States Tax Court. He's the managing principal of R.J. Baker and Associates with offices in Allegan and Holland, and his firm fights hard to protect people's constitutional rights throughout Michigan. And I know he brought some extra business cards tonight, so if you have issues or know someone that has constitutional issues, you want to talk to Robert. He's here tonight. So without further ado, and also our, 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 uh, at the same time, our second speaker is uh, Marlena of Marlena's Bistro. Marlena Pavlos, Pavlos Hackney is a naturalized U.S. citizen that immigrated from communist Poland. She owns and operated until it was shut down Marlena's Bistro and Pizzeria in Holland. And she hopes to reopen soon, and we all hope she does, too. <laughs> Without further ado, Mr. Baker and Marlena. Hello. Thank you for coming. I uh, was going to preach today. Uh, <laughs> The pastor knows that I wanted to be a pastor at one time, and my uh, sermon was going to be on Do You Have the Stones? And it's basically David's story. He picked up five smooth stones when he went to fight Goliath, and I feel like we're fighting Goliath right now. S so we have, um, originally I was brought in about uh, 30 minutes prior to Marlena's uh, hearing in front of Judge Aquilina. Uh, I commend you to go to YouTube and watch that. It was a travesty of justice. Um, she, her, at least three or four of her constitutional rights were violated. We're fighting that. We're, we're struggling just trying to get an accurate transcript. I filed motion after motion. Um, we have asked for the video, which they said don't exist. We found out it does exist, and they won't give it to us. So um, we're fighting the good fight. Uh, we just had a hearing on the transcript and the video. They refused, the judge refused to allow me to even argue it. She gave me 10 minutes, and I had prepared 13 hours to argue this. So uh, we lost that motion. So we're going to appeal that. I'm going to file, we're going to file um, as soon as possible a federal lawsuit to test the constitutionality of not only what they did to her, but also the underlying um, rules that the health department set up in or order to shut her down. The, um, well, 
Yeah, I only have a few minutes, so I wanted Marlena to say something also. So thank well, you. I would. I would like to say to everyone, thanks for your support. Uh, thanks for your praise. I really appreciate all of you that you helped me to go through to this difficult battle that I'm dealing with. Um, following the God's enable rights that we all do have, and we have the rights to work, provide for ourselves, I don't think so I break any law because this is God's country. He created this earth. We all equal have the same rights regardless as belief, as race, we all equal people. So I don't understand why the government, he tried to input and interfere with us constitutional protected rights. So I will do whatever will takes I will stand up, I will not give up, like I told Robert, I will not comply because we have to fight for us freedom and for us constitutional protected rights. We are the people and God is in charge. I know he will hear all us voices and will deliver the freedom that we fight for. And this fight is not about one party or another. This fight is about us, we the people. We have to be united. We see what is right and what is wrong. And what they're doing to all of us, this is unacceptable. And we have to stick together and do the right things to make sure that we will accomplish the fight that we wanted to have the victory. Thank you, praise the Lord, and I love you all. God bless America. Oh, Marlena, come here. We've been waiting to uh, give this to Marlena, the generosity of our people at the last few meetings. We've taken up a collection, and we wanted to give this to Marlena personally to use however she sees fit. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless America. I love you all. Thank you, Marlena. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Great. Okay, now we're going to start a usual order of business. Um, we start out with a pledge, and if my friend Bart Spencer will join us, uh, he will lead us in the pledge, and then we'll have an opening prayer. Stand together if you would. I just told Robert, I said, I didn't know he was in the army. I thought he was in the military. <laughs> so, <laughs> is that right, dog? No. Yeah, that's, right. that's good. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this evening. Again, the importance of getting the information out. Father, you've told us when it comes to the gospel to go into all the world and preach the gospel, teach all nations. And Father, the importance of having the right information is critical that we might make godly decisions. And so, Lord, I thank you for the meeting tonight. I ask your blessing to be upon it. Thank you for Marlene and her stand and Robert and his work and your blessing will be upon their efforts as we continue to support them. And again, throughout the service tonight, that our attention would be keen and sharp to what it is you want us to take home from this meeting tonight. Thank you again for the opportunity of being here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Right. You can be seated. Yeah, Bart was in the Air Force, so he has kind of strong feelings about what is military and what isn't. He tried that on Denny, Denny Gillum. Didn't work too good. Denny's a West Point graduate. He had a good response. Um, to just let you know, uh, there's two goals we have at the Patriots. One, to educate you and bring you truth and facts. And we don't compromise on that. We get the best speakers we can on the hot topics of the day, and we make sure that these are people that really have the goods, not just opinions or spin. These are people that can back up what they say with factual, truthful information. 
we don't compromise on that ever knowingly. Um, and it's no different tonight. Um, we also have some other groups in the lobby. Usually we have groups that relate to the topic. So after we educate you, we then challenge you to do something about it. It's not enough to just come and hear a good lecture, a good speaker. You need to do something about it. Well, tonight, a lot of what you have to do is educate yourselves. And right at the back, we have two tables, uh, one that Jason Hayes has for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. He has a lot of free materials, handouts. Make sure you stop back, say hi to him after the meeting's over. Get some of his materials because they do a lot of research. Jason is their head guy on the environmental issues, and he's a real good resource. And I think they have, I don't, do you have a sign-up sheet also, Jason, uh, to get on your newsletter and so forth? Okay, yeah, he'll give you information and you can get on their uh, email list and they'll send you good information. You really want to avail yourself of it. They're a first-rate research group. And my friend Steve um, Gorham has uh, written three books and uh, they're for sale tonight. I strongly recommend you go back, take a look at them, and you may want to pick them up. If you want factual, accurate information on the environment, Steve's got the goods. And while all the books are good, my favorite is the one that has the polar bears driving the convertible with the top down called The Mad, Mad World of Climatism. And it's, it's written in a real fun way. And he says it's really great for high school and college students. I think it's good for old people that need uh, easy reading. But uh, it's factual. It's accurate. It's a lot of fun. And it's, if you've got kids or you want to learn more about the environment, pick up some literature from Jason, get one of more of Steve's books tonight. And then we also have other groups in the hallway. We have a Right to Life table. Uh, we have um, uh, the Ottawa County GOP uh, has a, a table out there with some information. And uh, Rhett DeBoer, their uh, county chair, is there. She has some of those um, objectionable signs. Uh, God is Lord over Ottawa County that offended so many people in the Sentinel. So if you want to offend your neighbors, you can pick up one of those God is uh, Lord over Ottawa County signs and put it in your yard. Um, apparently, some people are offended by that. Uh, and also, there's a, a new group called Unite for Michigan. Lisa Wall is the president of that. And Lisa's a very talented uh, young woman. And she has a free service and is trying to provide a service to nonprofit groups, grassroots groups, churches that are trying to get their information out to people. And she's trying to be the connector to make that possible. So stop back and say hi to Lisa. She's in the far corner with the big table. And she's trying something very unique. And one of the things that we don't do enough in the conservative movement is we don't talk to each other. There's a lot of groups that are springing up and they don't know each other exist. Lisa's trying to hook them together. So that's very important because you don't know how many of us there are that feel the same way until you start finding out they exist. I see just in the audience friends from Allegan County and elsewhere that have their own groups and are doing their own thing. And that's why we need to uni unite and work together. Um, so that, that's available to you tonight. Um, I'm doing my five-minute intro now, so you can give me about a second, and I'll get started. Uh, basically, uh, we're living in perilous times. Uh, most of you know a little bit about Greek mythology and the old Trojan horse uh, analogy, where uh, they couldn't, uh, the Greeks could not uh, win the battle for Troy. There were very strong walls, very strong military. So they built a huge horse, stuck it outside the doors at night. Uh, the curious Trojans hauled it inside. It was full of Greek soldiers. They came down at night, and they opened the doors and won the battle. Well, the Trojan horse is an analogy. It's a means to conquer people by stealth and treachery. And that's what we're facing in the environmental movement today, stealth and treachery. Our children are being misled and terrified by climate and environmental radicals. Objective truth and facts have been replaced by wild, unproven chi chi climate change theories. 
We're being deliberately misled into giving up our freedom and prosperity for a fool's errand. We're being told we must give up fossil fuels, meat, and prosperity to save the planet. We can and must do something or everything we hold dear will be lost forever. The press and media today don't serve us well. They've gone from being watchdogs to being lapdogs for the liberals to being attack dogs on their behalf against us. Any conservative group, any pro-life group, they're going to be attacked by the media. Media is no longer the fourth estate, but a contemporary fifth column undermining our liberties. Some of our children and our political leaders believe the world is going to end in 11 years. If you challenge conventional wisdom about climate change, you will be demonized and called names like a climate denier. Our children are being indoctrinated, not educated on these topics. Truth and facts don't exist much anymore. There's very little objective truth. Good is called evil, and evil is called good. Truth and facts have been replaced by propaganda, fake news, slander, calumny, Marxist ideology, and woke culture. Global warming, in my opinion, is good, not bad. Throughout history, when there was a warming period, the Romans would note, hey, it's a longer growing season, and the grapes are growing further north in Italy. That was seen as a good thing back in Roman times. They didn't have SUVs, though. And, uh, but we're told global warming is a terrible thing. Climate is always changing, and we don't have much impact on it. Uh, I've got some books just from my library back by our uh, bulletin board there. And there's one written by uh, Fred Singer, who's a, one of the fathers of the environmental movement. And it says, global warming every 1,500 years, whether you're ready for it or not. And it's a very interesting book about they did core samples deep into the earth, and they could determine the weather thousands of years ago. And it's been warmer than it is now, and it's been colder than it is now. It has nothing to do with man-made climate change. Devious individuals are using the climate issues like wolves in sheep's clothing to harm us. Climate alarmism is a growth industry not based on facts, but on financial greed and a lust for political power. We must educate ourselves with the facts and truth on these issues and teach others. We must stand up against climate alarmism and re-educate our people to the truth. We must stand up against fake news and junk science and demand truth. We must, we must peacefully protest attacks on our prosperity and free market economy, and everyone can and must do more. See the speakers, educate yourself, talk to other people. Get the facts, not the junk science. Ronald Reagan said very famously, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. We cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it for today. Pay attention to the speakers, visit them at the tables, educate yourself, and educate others before it's too late. Thank you. organized this morning. Oh, I'd like a special thanks to um, my wife Rose who organized the reception that we had in the back room and spent a lot of time today <laughs> getting that in good order so that uh, you could have a nice little soiree back there. Our first speaker is someone who's been here before. Uh, how many people have heard Steve speak at a Patriots meeting before? Raise your hand. Okay, a few. So there's a lot of, a lot of new people here tonight, Steve. Um, he always brings new stuff and always reminds us about how much we don't know. He's the executive director of the Climate Science Coalition of America. He's an independent columnist, speaker, and author of three books, Climatism, the Science of Common Sense in the 21st Century's Hottest Topic, The Mad, Mad World of Climatism, 
Mankind and Climate Change Mania. That is my favorite. And Outside the Green Box, Rethinking Sustainable Development. Steve is a well-regarded researcher, writer, and speaker on environmental issues. He holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois. He also holds an MBA from the University of Chicago. He has over 30 years of experience as an engineer and executive in Fortune 500 companies. And without a doubt, Steve Gorham is, in my opinion, and I read a lot, one of the best researchers on these issues in the United States today. Don't leave tonight without saying hi to him at his table. And if you don't have any books on the environment, buy his. Without further ado, Mr. Steve Gorham. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, Patriots. Absolutely great to join you again this evening. I think I've been here four other times, although I can't remember prior to 2017. <laughs> but uh, thanks for the work that you do for limited government and for sound public policy. Is it advancing? It's not advancing here. Oh, excuse me, I didn't turn it on. That helps. <laughs> All right. President uh, elect Barack Obama a few years ago. All right. Future. Climate change in our environment. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's go back. Few challenges facing America and the world are more urgent than combating climate change. The science is beyond dispute, and the facts are clear. Sea levels are rising. Coastlines are shrinking. We've seen record drought, spreading famine, and storms that are growing stronger with each passing hurricane season. Climate change and our environmental challenges are the, one of the biggest existential threats to our way of life. Not, at, not just as a nation, but as a world. Ladies and gentlemen of Michigan, we live in a world of superstition. Every year, maybe not last year, but tens of thousands of people march around the world demanding that our government leaders control the climate. And many of those people believe if they change light bulbs, they can save polar bears. Or if they build wind turbines, they can stop the oceans from rising. Or if we all drive electric cars, we can make the storms less frequent and less severe. I call that climatism. The belief that humans are causing dangerous global warming. And former President Obama and Representative Ocasio-Cortez are in good company. Today, more than 190 heads of state believe in the theory of man-made warming. The United Nations, the news media, most of our leading universities, most of our scientific organizations, most of the Fortune 500 companies all subscribe to the theory. And the world is spending over $500 billion a year to try and stop the planet from warming. Whoop, how'd I get ahead here? Excuse me. <laughs> the theory of man-made warming is based on four principles. The first is the greenhouse effect. Sunlight enters our atmosphere. It's absorbed by the surface of the Earth. Like any warm body, the Earth gives off lower energy infrared radiation. A tiny amount of that goes directly out into space. But most is absorbed by greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Those gases then re-radiate that energy, and that does tend to warm the surface of the Earth. The second basis is rising atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Modern measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide were first made in the 1950s. At that time, scientists measured about 315 parts per million. That has risen to over 400 parts per million. And the proponents of the theory of man-made warming say that this rise is caused by our industry, it's adding to the greenhouse effect, and it's causing global temperatures to rise. 
The third basis is rising global surface temperatures. But the rise has been fairly gentle. Over the last 140 years, global temperatures have risen about one degree Celsius, about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And the fourth basis is computer model projections. Supercomputers like this one in England run climate models, and those models forecast a much faster rise, a rise of 3 degrees Celsius or 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100. And you've all heard about the coming disasters, melting ice caps, rising ocean levels flooding our coastal cities, stronger hurricanes and storms, droughts and floods, species extinction, and many other problems. But men and women of Michigan, there is no empirical evidence that increase in greenhouse gases are the primary cause of global warming. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations has said that the increase in temperature in the 20th century is likely to be the largest of any century during the past thousand years. Let's put that in perspective. Oh, I keep skipping ahead. I apologize. <laughs> this is a bit of a complex graph here. This captures Chicago record temperatures over the last 140 years for each day of the year from January 1st to December 31st. That blue curve is the record cold temperature for each day of the year. The red curve is the record hot temperature for each day of the year. And that gray bar in the middle is the average max and min. And our temperatures in Chicago are similar to Western Michigan. Typical year, we go from about minus 5 Fahrenheit up to about 95 Fahrenheit, about a swing of 100 degrees. I'm going to superimpose on here. Well, I've already done it. I can see it. <laughs> the extent of mean global temperature variation. That line right there captures the rise over the last 140 years within the thickness of that line. This is what uh, climate scientists says is a coming disaster. So the floods, the dying polar bears, the rising oceans, the forest fires, the storms, those are all due a one, to a one degree rise in 140 years. Does that make any sense? Now, we've all heard that the Arctic ice is melting, the glaciers in Glacier National Park are melting. The important thing to remember is that melting is evidence of warming, but it does not tell you the cause of the warming. Another thing we hear all the time is climate change is real. I hope none of you are using that phrase. That's a true statement, but that's like saying water is wet. That's a meaningless statement. Climate change has been, has, climate, its climate has been changing for all of Earth's history. Two well-known periods of the climate change are the medieval warm period and the little ice age. The medieval warm period was a period from about 900 to 1300 AD when the Vikings settled southwest Greenland. They founded a colony at Havasi, which grew to 5,000 inhabitants. They farmed, they raised livestock, they hunted polar bears. And a historical work, the Book of Icelanders, said that in those days there were trees six meters tall in Havasi, or 20 feet. But today, this is an image of the old stone church. There are no trees on this site today, nothing but scrub grasses, an indication that it was naturally warmer a thousand years ago there than it is today. About 1300, we entered the period called the Little Ice Age, and that colony died out. Very tough period in Europe. Shorter growing seasons, famine. The island of, of Iceland became ice locked by frozen seas for much of the year, and the population went down by a half. But at London every year, they would have a festival they called the Frost Fest. This is an image of the Frost Fest. The Thames River would freeze solid at London. They'd bring out horses and wagons and build sheds and have this festival. Well, you can't do that today. The Thames River hasn't frozen solid in more than a century. The medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age were two periods of naturally warmer and cooler temperatures, nothing to do with power plants or sport utility vehicles. If we look a little more quantitatively, this is data from ice cores from Greenland. Start here at zero, go back two, four, six, eight, ten thousand years to the end of the last ice age. We see the temperatures rise and fall, rise and fall. 
you can see the medieval warm period here, the little ice age, and here's our modern warm period. Now in the press, they talk about the decade from 2010 to 2019 was the warmest on record, <laughs> which sounds very ominous. The key words there are on record, though. On record refers to the thermometer record, which we've only had since about 1880. So I'm going to put on record on the map here. See that? Wow, that's the warmest decade on record. That's very misleading, and it ignores the four periods in the past when we've had warmer temperatures naturally than today. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, like others, has said climate change is occurring and humans play a contributing role. Yeah, I agree with that statement. Again, another meaningless statement. Climate is always changing. My 12-pound dog plays a contributing role. <laughs> the real question is, what is the size of the human contribution from industry versus global factors? Because Earth's climate is complex. This is just a simplified diagram. It's shaped by powerful forces in the solar system, the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land. Sunlight drives all weather on Earth. Sunlight falls directly on the tropics and the tropical re the uh, equator in the tropical region where much energy is absorbed. Sunlight falls indirectly on the polar regions where little energy is, uh, is absorbed. All weather, jet streams, ocean currents, storm fronts, hurricanes, all redistribute energy from the tropics to the poles. The oceans have a powerful effect on Earth's climate. The oceans can hold 200, have 250 times the mass of the atmosphere and can hold more than 1,000 times the heat. And then we have aerosols, dust from volcanoes, desert dust, pollen from plants, going up into the atmosphere and shaping the climate. Yet today's climate scientists are obsessed with the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a very small part of the overall picture. And indeed, CO2 is a trace gas. One way to think about it is an NCAA tournament game. Only four of every 10,000 molecules in the atmosphere are carbon dioxide. And the amount that humans could have added in all of our history is only a fraction of one of those 10,000 molecules. So I'll have, a, I'll have several questions for you today. Feel, feel free to just fire out the answer. And uh, so the first one is, what's nature's most abundant greenhouse gas? Well, I did hear the right answer somewhere. It's not methane. It's not carbon dioxide. The answer is water vapor. Scientists estimate that somewhere between 75 and 90 percent of Earth's greenhouse effect is caused by water vapor in clouds. And you remember, the greenhouse effect is what's blamed for dangerous global warming. So if we break down the greenhouse effect and we're conservative and we say, okay, three quarters of that is due to water vapor and clouds, that means the last quarter of Earth's greenhouse effect is mostly due to carbon dioxide, some methane and other gases. But then we need to say, of that quarter, how much of that is natural versus human industry? Because the oceans have 50 times as much carbon dioxide as the atmosphere as the atmosphere dissolved naturally. And the oceans are always releasing carbon dioxide and absorbing it. When plants grow, they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When they die, carbon dioxide is released. And then we have volcanoes, both above the surface of the ocean, about 10 times as many under the surface of the ocean, putting carbon dioxide and other gases into the environment all the time. Every day, nature puts 20 times as much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as all of our industries and removes about the same amount. So when we roll this all together, we find that humans are responsible for about, if I can get this right here, 1% of Earth's greenhouse effect, one to two parts per hundred. Who's heard that in the press? Nobody. That means if we, can, if we eliminate all emissions, we probably could not measure the difference in global temperatures. Now, in 1990, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made a temperature forecast. 
They predicted that global temperatures were going to rise during the next century about 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade with a minimum of 0.2 per decade and a uh, maximum of 0.5 per, per decade. So we can take a look now and see how that's going. These three lines are the IPCC's high estimate, best estimate, and low estimate. Those are their predictions. But actual temperatures have been below and remain below their low estimate. They use climate models to make these projections, and it's clear now that the climate models are wrong. They're over-predicting the warming. I view climate as, as a pollution problem. It is, in my words, carbon pollution is just like every other pollutant. It actually impacts the poor in minority communities more heavily than anyone else. It impacts our kids and our elderly. And a carbon pollution exacerbates those problems. Well, I could disagree with many things that uh, Gina McCarthy is saying, former head of the EPA. I'm going to uh, pick on two of them, though. She's using the wrong term. Carbon is wrong. We're talking about carbon dioxide. I want to meet her someday and ask her, do you call salt chlorine? <laughs> carbon and carbon dioxide are completely different substances. So that's the first problem. The second is that it's, it's, it is bizarre to call carbon dioxide pollution. Carbon dioxide is not po a pollutant. It's an odorless, harmless, invisible gas. It doesn't cause smoke or smog. That vapor you see rising from a power plant, that's not carbon dioxide. That's condensing water vapor. You can't see carbon dioxide. We inhale a, only a trace of carbon dioxide every time we inhale, but we continuously produce it as we burn sugar in our body. So every time each one of you exhales, you, in, you exhale a concentration that is 100 times what is in the atmosphere. And CO2 is green. Carbon dioxide is plant food. Hundreds of peer-reviewed studies show that plants grow bigger and faster with higher levels of carbon dioxide. This is a graph of the world's top seven food crops. Corn, potatoes, wheat, sugar cane, rice, soybeans, and sugar beets all grow between 20 and 70 percent bigger with higher levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Plants get bigger fruits, they get bigger vegetables, they get thicker tree trunks, they get bigger root systems. They're more resistant to drought. If there's one compound we could put in the atmosphere that's absolutely great for the environment, carbon dioxide is that compound. It's one of the three essential compounds there are, oxygen, water, and carbon dioxide. Yet we have every university today, every company counting their carbon dioxide footprint, very, very foolish. And satellite data, this is from Australia, shows that the world is greening. From 1980 to 2010, as carbon dioxide has been rising in the atmosphere, we've had more foliage across the world. As CO2 levels rise, temperatures rise. The result, as the world gets warmer, the climate changes. And extreme weather events become more common. Well, Dr. Suzuki sounds convincing, but the evidence doesn't support his assertion. Got to get that s slide straight here. Where am I? Did I skip a slide? I did. <laughs> well, let me talk about the weather events first, and then I'll go back. Uh, so, for the last 40 years, scientists have been looking down with satellites. 40 or 50 years, and they can track every tropical cyclone on the surface of the Earth and measure its wind speed. And then this is a, a, a two plots here. The top graph shows the number of tropical storms that have been on the planet over each preceding 12-month period. There's an average of about 95 or so every, every year. The bottom graph shows the number of stronger hurricanes, about 40 in every 12-month period. Now, if you look at this chart, you can see, well, there really isn't a trend of an increasing number of tropical storms or hurricanes. And this graph is also a measure of storm strength. Because if tropical storms were getting stronger, more of them would surpass the threshold of being a hurricane. And so we'd see hurricanes rising. But it isn't happening. Number of hurricane landfalls has been flat to declining. 
This is uh, data from NOAA. We get about two landfalls a year on the hurricanes, sometimes as high as six, like last year. But overall, there is no trend of increasing number of landfalling hurricanes. And drought and flood, it's often talked about. But the, our own US government has very good data on droughts and floods. They use a thing called the Palmer Drought Index, which measures the percentage of the US that's either very wet or very dry every year. This is for the continental United States, the lower 48. The top curve shows the percentage of the US that's very wet over the last 100 years or so. The bottom shows the percentage of the US that's very dry over the last 100 years or so. But again, there are, there are many, many periods of very wet or very dry weather, but no increasing trend of drought or flood can be seen. OK, I'm going to go back and go over this one chart I missed. Sorry about that. Is it going to let me go back? <laughs> Come on. I want to talk once more about the absurdity of carbon dioxide uh, being called a pollutant. Ugh. So eighth grade chemistry, equation for combustion. Fuel plus oxygen plus heat produces what? Produces carbon dioxide. and also produces water vapor. Matter of fact, if you burn methane gas, natural gas, in your house, you produce two water vapor molecules for each molecule of carbon dioxide. Since water vapor is produced by human industry, and because it's the most important greenhouse gas, we should now decide that water vapor is a pollutant. Water is a pollutant. That's how goofy this stuff has become. As CO2 right. level. Let's go on here and see if I can get back to in shape. Okay, what about sea level rise? Former Vice President Gore and Dr. James Hansen of NASA have predicted a 20 foot sea level rise by the year 2100. If that were to occur, it would be a disaster. It would flood major coastal cities around the world. It would uh, flood all this red area in, in Florida. So a couple things to know about sea level rise. Now, the IPCC says that sea level rise is accelerating. They say the history prior to uh, 2003 was that it was rising about 1.8 millimeters per year and now it's accelerated to three millimeters per year. So what does that mean in terms of millimeters? I forgot to bring up my, my visual aids, my dime and my quarter. The thickness of a quarter is at 1.8 millimeters a year. And if you add the, the rise of 1.2 millimeters, that's the thickness of the dime. Anybody think that scientists can measure using uh, satellites in orbit a change across all the oceans of the world of a thin dime every year? Folks, it can't be done. Tides rise 36 feet in some locations around the world. The average wave height in the center of the ocean is three meters. And those are irregular. And the, the measurement error on the satellites is one to two centimeters on each measurement. They're trying to measure millimeters, 10 times smaller. Folks, this is based on climate science ideology, nothing else. Tide gauges show no acceleration. The highest quality coastal tide gauges from around the world show no evidence of acceleration in the seas since 1920. Sea levels have been rising for the last 20,000 years, and they're rising about seven or eight inches per century. Those are the facts. So what's the record high temperature for Michigan? Today it was about 82. Anybody know what the all-time state record is? Yeah, you heard me yesterday morning, right? Or you just, you know it, yeah, on the radio. 112 Fahrenheit. It was in Stanwood, which is a little northeast of here. And if you look at the surrounding states, you find something interesting. So the, uh, the record in Wisconsin was set back in 1936. The record in Illinois in 1954. The record in Indiana set in 1936. The record in Ohio set in 1954. Now wait a minute. Wait a minute, we're, this is in period, uh, a period of warming. These are all 60 or more years ago, 60 to 85 years ago. How can that possibly be? Matter of fact, if you look for the United States, you see a similar thing. These are data from NOAA again, the US state high temperature records. 
and 35 of the 50 states set their record prior to 1960. Again, evidence that this idea that we're in drastically warmer temperatures, probably not correct. Well, my wife and I uh, bought a second house two years ago in Virginia Beach. Uh, I've got uh, a daughter, son-in-law, and one grandchild down there, soon to be two, so we're, we're enjoying that. And we go there five months, and we come back to Chicago. But that very same year, we had 74 U.S. medical and health organizations declare that, U that climate change was a U.S. health emergency. And they said that warm temperatures are dangerous. So I'm thinking, wow, am I endangering my wife and my health? Virginia Beach is about six degrees Celsius warmer than Chicago. We must, be, we must be hurting our health, right? And what if you lived in Miami? People must just be dropping dead there all the time. <laughs> so I got another question for you. Are hot or cold temperatures more hazardous to health? Cold. You folks are smarter than the US government. The answer is cold. The flu season in the Northern Hemisphere is from about October to March every year, the cold months. The flu season in the Southern Hemisphere is from about April to August, they're cold months. In COVID, more people got COVID and got sick in the cold months. More people die in the cold months. A study done by a guy by the name of Phalagus, he took a look at 10 different countries and plotted the deaths per month for each country. And in every case, these are two of those 10 countries. This is Australia, this is Sweden. The cold months, more people die. So the fact is, if we have a little warming, we're gonna have millions of people that don't die because the temperatures are warmer. And another, another question, so why don't seniors retire to North Dakota, Saskatchewan, and Alaska? Well, some of them do, but most retire here. Aren't they foolish? Don't they know our own US government says warm climates are dangerous? Folks, that's how crazy this has all gotten. So last year was quite a tough year, 2020. This is a look at, at what happened in April. This is the... Uh, violet curve is, is miles traveled. It dropped about 40% in April. We haven't had that low of miles traveled in the United States since about 1930. Industrial activity was also down. Okay, so um, remember, industrial activity is supposed to be causing the rise in carbon dioxide, this, this rising atmospheric carbon dioxide. So if you, if you look at rising atmospheric CO2, and I'm going to show you a closer curve in a minute, there's no change. Emissions are down 10%. So I'm thinking about this, and this reminded me of a clip from a few years ago that some of you have probably seen. It certainly is a big bun. It's a very big bun. Big fluffy bun. It's a very big fluffy bun. Where's the beef? Where's the beef? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. So I'm So I'm I'm looking at this curve. This is a close up of the rising CO2 and there are there are seasonal things that as the trees get leaves or not. So where's the big change? Anybody see the beef? We just had a big plunge in, in global economic activity. Absolutely undetectable in the rise of atmospheric CO2. And if you go to NASA or NOAA, they go, well, the amount was too small to show a change. Well, yeah, because natural factors are dominating the rise in CO2, not our industry. So the bottom line is climate change is natural. It's not man-made. Global warming is dominated by natural cycles of the Earth, uh, driven by the sun. I talk about that in each of my first two books. And man-made greenhouse gases play only a very minor role in global warming. So let's go on to the myths of uh, renewable energy. Did I skip over one already? Yeah, again. <laughs> Our world is beset by climate legislation. A 2020 study by the Grantham Institute counted more than 1,800 national climate change laws across 133 nations, covering carbon pricing, emissions trading, feed-in tariffs to promote renewables, laws to reduce energy demand, laws on transportation. And as a result, we've had a big rise in wind and solar. Oops, skipped another one. 
Since 2000, wind globally has grown at a compounded rate of about 21.5% a year, and solar has grown about 40% a year. And we have some pretty good penetration of wind in a number of nations, particularly Denmark. They get about 40% of their, of their electricity from, from wind. For the world, it's about, by the way, we're at about 8% in 2020. For the world, though, only about 6% of the electricity comes from wind, and, which is about 2.2% of the energy, so it's still pretty small. If we look at solar, similar sorts of penetration, about 8% in Germany, uh, 2019. California, 14% of electricity generation came from solar. But again, in the world, only about 3% of the electricity and about 1.1% of the energy after 20 years of subsidies and 1,800 laws, et cetera. So another question for you. So since 2000, which U.S. electricity generating source grew the most? Bingo. What a smart audience this is. <laughs> Natural gas added a million gigawatt hours in the last 20 years or so. Gas grew from 16% to 40% of U.S. power, U.S. electricity. At the same time, solar and wind grew from zero to about 11%. And this trend really isn't changing. Gas as a total continues to grow faster than renewables, despite all the headlines that you hear. And world natural gas consumption is soaring, up by a factor of seven since 1965. I love this curve. I call this the energy mountain. World energy consumption has tripled since 1965, and the rate of of consumption has actually increased since about 2000. So I've plotted on here the amount that wind and solar are providing. Pretty tiny. Every year the world adds about a united kingdom of, a different, uh, of additional energy, and renewables can't even provide for the increase every year, let alone replace our traditional energy sources. Another fun chart. This is a, a bit of a timeline here. The world has spent $4 trillion in the last 16 years on renewables. 1989, the United Nations formed the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to warn us about global warming. Uh, 1996, we had the Kyoto Protocol Climate Treaty, where 190 nations signed up, and many agreed they would reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The United States was the one big exception that never signed that treaty. And today we have about 300,000 wind turbines installed around the world. But when you look at this graph, this graphs the hydrocarbon share of world energy, coal, oil, and gas. And we're still at 81%, the same as we were, as, uh, that we were in 1991. U.S. energy consumption by source, 2019. Did I miss a chart again? <laughs> I missed another chart. How am I doing that? Okay, I got to get you back to a chart here. So it's important to understand that society consumes massive amounts of energy, 600 exajoules every year, which has got about 18 zeros. It's equivalent to 43,000 Hoover dams. Folks, it's a big, big amount. Now let's get back here with the... Uh, Here's the U.S. consumption by source, 2019, 37% oil, 32% gas, 11% coal, 8% nuclear. This is energy now, not electricity. Renewables about 8.8%. Most of that is ethanol for your car. So the question ought to be, why haven't renewables taken a bigger share uh, with all these subsidies and all these laws? And the reason is there are three big strikes against renewables. One is that renewables are dilute. It requires vast amounts of land, in the case of wind and solar, to provide an equivalent amount to a power plant. About 75 to 100 times more land for solar, about 200 to 250 times more land for wind. Strike is that renewables are intermittent. The average capacity factor for 60,000 U.S. wind turbines in 2019 was about 32%. Now, capacity factor is the actual output versus the rated output. So it gives you kind of a percentage. So on average, wind gives you about a third of its rated output. This is a look at Texas in a typical month. It was 2014. 
March, you can see this is the wind output in Texas. Spikes drops to zero, spikes drop to zero, very, very intermittent. And the UK, whoop, did I skip another one? Yeah. I did. <laughs> the UK House of Lords said it right. The intermittent nature of wind turbines means that they can replace only a little of the capacity of fossil fuels and nuclear power plants if security of supply is to be maintained. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. I missed another one here. Come on. Okay. I love this uh, picture here. This is indication of solar inter intermittency. You've seen some of that stuff in Michigan. You also got issues with cloudy days and with uh, night. Now, you hear a lot of stuff about renewables are the cheapest electricity, and they have come down, but they say cheaper than coal. They say cheaper than uh, wind. Uh, sorry, cheaper than uh, natural gas. It is true that the construction costs for wind and solar systems have come down. Solar down about 50% in the last five to seven years. Wind, onshore wind down about a third. But these don't capture all the costs. These don't capture the cost of intermittency. They don't capture the cost of the transmission. You have to build the remote areas. So take a look at this one. This is a little bit complicated, but what I've done here is for the nations of Europe, I've graphed the wind and solar capacity on the vertical axis, uh, the watts per person of a nation, and on the horizontal axis, the residential electricity price. Now, if wind and solar were cheaper, this graph should be going the other way. The guys with the more, most wind and solar should have the cheapest electricity prices. But it isn't the case. In almost every case, the guys that have the most wind and solar have the highest prices. Ireland has double the US electricity price, Denmark and, and Germany more than three times the amount. And we see a similar thing in the United States, not quite so tangible, but uh, this blue line indicates that our national average increase of electricity is up a little less than 9% over the last 12 years. Very low, 9%, that's lower than inflation over 12 years. But what I've plotted is all of the leading wind states and in nine of the 12 wind states, the increases have been between 20 and 40%. So in those states, rates are rising faster than the national average, showing again wind and solar are not cheaper. We'll take steps towards my goal of achieving 100% carbon pollution-free electric sector by 2035. So despite these problems, the federal government the state governments have all decided they're going to go zero carbon, the new buzzword, by t up to 2050, Mr. Biden, by 2035. Let's talk about some of the issues. Oh, by the way, about 14 states now, including your state of Michigan, are going to go to net zero uh, targets by 2050. First thing this is going to do is require huge amounts of land. Just last year, Princeton University, who is pretty much in favor of all this uh, renewable stuff, put out a study saying that to get to net zero by 2050 was going to require 228,000 square miles of land. That's bigger than these six states, and it doesn't include transmission. Can you imagine? <laughs> now, the, the other problem with, with renewables is, I skipped one. Thank you. These guys are helping me out. <laughs> The problem with this is, as you say, well, I'm going to go to 50% renewable or 80% renewable penetration, if you're going to maintain continuity of electricity supply, you have to keep the old systems around, the nuclear, the coal, the natural gas, because when the wind and solar don't blow or don't, don't uh, provide electricity, you're going to have outages. So you have to keep those systems around. That's this black and then this gray and red. Those have to stay. You have to have 90% of that continuing. And then you add more and more wind and solar capacity. And what you do is you run the traditional systems very inefficiently, much lower utilization rates. But you end up building all this capacity. This is a study by Brick and Thernstrom that was done a few years ago. You end up doubling capacity for 50% re renewables, almost tripling the amount of capacity you have to maintain as you go to 80% renewables. And as a result, whoop, I missed, a, I missed another one. OK. The wholesale electricity cost, again, a projection by Brick and Thernstrom, has to double and then almost triple again. And to go to 100%, you know, you just keep going with this stuff. 
So not only are we going to need huge amounts of land, we're going to require much, much higher electricity rates. Oh, but suppose you say, well, I don't worry. I'm not going to worry if I'm going to maintain continuity of electricity supply. <laughs> and we got some of that going on. California had wide area rolling blackouts in August 2020. In the summer, their solar output is like 20% of their electricity until about 6 p.m. And then by 7 p.m., it's gone. And if you have some other system fail, guess what? You have to shut down people's electricity across your state. Oh, and by the way, they want everybody to go to electric cars and electric stoves. So not only will you not be able to put the lights on, you won't be able to drive your car or heat your house or air condition your house. Real, real great idea. They have closed 11 coal plants since 2007, half of their nuclear, and even their natural gas generation is down 10%. So they're struggling right now with what to do. And you all were, I think you caught the news in February. We had wide area blackouts particularly in Texas, the number one wind state in the country. They had a wind turbine freeze up. They had four million people without power, and 130 people died from this blackout. They also ran out of natural gas, which was a big problem. Uh, natural gas is hard to store. You have to have locations you can store it, and they underestimated the demand, and so the natural gas plants weren't putting out any uh, electricity either. Not much in the press, but the number three wind state, Oklahoma, also same kind of problem. They were getting 34% of their electricity from wind. They had 400,000 uh, people without power. And the governor, Kevin Stitt, says, we're not getting the wind. Some of the stuff is frozen. We've got ice on the propellers. And that, that pointed out a couple things. First, our most reliable electric power is coal and nuclear. Nuclear runs all the time. Uh, coal is great. You can just pile all that stuff up. Man, you've got all this coal sitting here. If you get a lot of demand, you, you can burn it. Uh, where natural gas, it's very hard to do that sort of thing. So these are our most reliable, really borne out last February. So are our utilities taking their eye off the ball? Now, if I was in Texas and ha I had electricity in February, and if I was smart, I'd have shut it off and I had to put a bunch of coats on. Those people got $10,000 electricity bills for about two weeks. Anybody here who can afford that? I mean, it's crazy. It used to be that utility priorities were reliable system and the price to the rate payer, but not anymore. Now it's renewables. You got to trade all that stuff off for that. Now, some are saying that grid scale batteries are the solution. So let me talk about this a little bit. Headlines, a deluge of batteries is about to rewire the power grid. Giant batteries are cheap, solar are sh and cheap solar are shoving fossil fuels off the grid. So I got a pretty tough question for you here. If I can get this, I'll be, I'll be really uh, uh, marveling at you. How much U.S. power uses grid battery storage? What percentage? Zero is pretty close. 0.01 is way too big. <laughs> so what, I, what I've done here is... Uh, Last year, I'm sorry, 2019, we generated about 4.1 million gigawatt hours. And that's all these blocks, 5,000 gigawatt hours per block. So to find out how much grid uh, batteries stored, you've got to go down to the one little block here. And then you go way down to this corner here. Less than one watt in every million watts is stored by grid battery storage. Those things could double, triple, up, go 10, 20 times for decades. And it wouldn't even it would scratch this thing. Let me give a practical example here. New York has said they're going to put uh, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind southeast of New York City. It's going to cost them about $9 billion. They're going to uh, put in 3,000 megawatts of battery capacity, $7.5 billion. The thing is that those batteries can take the wind output, they can, re, re, they can restore the output, by, they store it up first when the wind's high, and then they can release it. They can only do it for about two hours, two hours to back up those things. So to do it for 24 hours, you need 12 times the amount of batteries, you need $90 billion of batteries to back up nine, uh, $9 billion worth of wind for a single day. And if the wind was gone for two or three days, that wouldn't even be enough. Batteries just are, in, are, are inadequate, folks, with this idea that they can back up the grid. And they, people are going to find this out. 
Oh, now, come on. <laughs> you haven't even heard what she said. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> She's going to talk about your uh, healthy climate plan. This plan is one of the boldest plans in the United States. Michigan now joins California, New York, Hawaii, and Maine to commit to 100% economic carbon neutrality. We will continue to develop this plan alongside our new Climate Solution Advisory Council of experts and community members to make sure that Michigan's entire economy is carbon neutral by 2050. With so that's, that's beyond just electricity. This is now your heating and your vehicles, folks. It's coming. So let's talk about what's going on in, in other places here. Well, the first thing you're going to see is rising electricity prices. By the way, you may not know it, Michigan now has the highest electricity prices in the Midwest. Isn't that fun? So expect that to double if, if the governor gets her plans to go forward for the next few decades. And uh, electrification is the new buzzword. Uh, used to mean electrification used to mean getting electricity to rural areas. But now it means getting rid of your natural gas and forcing you to drive an electric vehicle. It's in process in California. There are now 40 California cities that have banned uh, gas appliances in new construction. About 10% of the population, including San Francisco and San Jose. Gas appliances, however, offer advantages. And particularly to those who a lot of their budget goes to utilities, the people with lesser income, they're going to be forced to, uh, to have electric appliances. The New York State Energy Research and Development Authority did a study on heat pumps, and they concluded that at current installed costs and prices, only about 4% of the state's residential, commercial, heating, ventilation, and air co conditioning could cost-effectively switch to using heat pumps. Almost nothing, folks. It's going to cost you more. And by the way, guess what the U.S. government just did? Probably if you have an air conditioner or a heat pump, they've, they are outlawing the coolant that's in that. In 80% of the heat pumps and air conditioners, it's something like a uh, RU410 coolant. It's in my son's. I was just noticing it the other day. That's going to be outlawed by 2022 or 2023. So they're going to really degrade the efficiency of the heat pumps. Uh, the environmental movement is shooting itself in the foot. In Netherlands, they've gone to gasless neighborhoods. Amsterdam says they're going to be a gasless city. The government is going to disconnect 170,000 homes per year and 7 million disconnections by 2050. That is the plan there. With more research and incentives, we can break our dependence on oil with biofuels and become the first country to have a million electric vehicles on the road by 2050. President Obama was optimistic. That hasn't happened. I think we've got about a million now. Sales of electrics last year were a little under 2% of the market, about um, 300,000 cars, 350,000 were electrics. But that share has actually been flat and slightly declining since 2018. Most U.S. people want SUVs and pickup trucks, 70% of sales. And by, by the way, the electric cars that are out there are only driven about 5,000 miles a year. Many of them are leased. And so, you know, you got to kind of wonder about this. Um, there are some advantages for electrics. As one gentleman pointed out today, the engine is simpler. Maintenance is easier. They also get faster pickup, and they are, they're very quiet. But they got two big disadvantages. Whoop, I skipped again. One of those is driving range. So look in the top right here. This is a comparison of an uh, internal combustion engine car and EVs. A 2020 Honda Civic has a 12.4 gallon gas tank. It can go 360 miles. That gas weighs about 77 and a half pounds. So if you take a Chevy Volt and you put a 77 and a half pound battery in, it can only go 21 miles. <laughs> what you need to go the same mileage is a massive battery, 1,334 pounds. And uh, with drive train adjustments, you need nine pounds of battery, battery for every one pound of gasoline. So when they get to equalizing the road taxes, guess who ought to be paying more? These really heavy vehicles, because they're going to have more impact on the roads. Second big advantage, disadvantage is cost. 
2020 Chevy Volt, the EV, price $36,600, manufacturer suggested price, a roughly equivalent Toyota Corolla at $19,600. And this EV price is, is too much for many, and I'm gonna talk about this gap in a moment. Uh, operating costs, EVs are less expensive at a home charger, but you probably gotta buy a home charger. If it's a fast charger, it'll cost you a couple thousand kind of thing. But more expensive at public chargers, and right now most EVs are not taxed, uh, vehicle taxes, they don't pay the gasoline tax, that's going to be changing. So the reason I don't think this cost gap is going to change very quickly, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, did I skip one? I did, whoa. <laughs> to, to make a single thousand pound electric vehicle battery requires moving 500,000 pounds of earth in a mine. And with this, with this output that everybody's talking about, EVs growing and growing, you're gonna have to increase global mining for cobalt, lithium, nickel, and copper by a factor of five or 10. That's total global mining of those minerals has to rise by five or 10 times. That is gonna keep a lid, it's gonna keep a gap in that price because you're not gonna do that and get the prices to drop way down. But Europe's going forward. Europe is gonna ban internal combustion engines uh, UK, Ireland, Netherlands, France, Norway, cities are banning diesel. And we've also seen it start in the United States. Just uh, last month, Washington State announced they're gonna ban gas cars by 2030. So look for the B word, it's coming, and they'll probably wanna do this in Michigan too if, if this continues. Okay, come on. Okay, let's talk about something, crazy things in the mad, mad, mad world of climatism. Oh, I skipped two. Sorry. <laughs> I'm ruining my presentation here. So has Domino Sugar done the impossible? <laughs> they now have a carbon-free bag of sugar. Now, I don't know, I had chemistry a long time ago, but sugar is made of hydrogen and oxygen and carbon. So you take the carbon out, what do you got? It's a bag of water, of course, right? <laughs> well, the thing is they buy a bunch of carbon offsets so then they can say it's carbon free, right? So, well, I'm ruining it here. <laughs> the United Nations urges people to eat insects. Insects are reported to emit less greenhouse gases, less ammonia than cattle or pigs. They require significantly less land or water than cattle rearing. So you've already seen the next slide, but what I, my thought was I'm gonna write a, another book and it's gonna be a cookbook called 101 Climate Safe, Safe Recipes. I'll put cricket casserole right there on the, right there on the cover. Cicadas. Cicadas, yeah. <laughs> and we're in the age of fake meat to save the planet, of course. Uh, artificially, artificially created meat, yeah, that's what I want. And get this headline, global warming could shrink the human race. I mean, they wrote this in all seriousness. Fortunately, there's, there's not much evidence for this. Oh, there it is. There's not a lot of evidence for this. If I could operate this thing, I'd be in good shape. So we, we have funny things in the mad, mad world of climatism, but we have tragedy as well. Adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as if you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house was on fire, because it is. I find that really, really sad. Here's a, a young girl from Sweden who has, has been used as a tool by the climate movement. She's not old enough to have a driver's license, yet she gets to lecture everybody in the world about what they ought to do about climate. And uh, a lot of our kids are being taught to fear, to fear climate change in school. It's very unfortunate. And um, remember this quote by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, founder of the Soviet Union, Give us a child for eight years and it will be a Bolshevik forever. Your children are being recruited to be climate activists. 
And the real sad thing is they're being recruited on false facts, on a false situation. So anyway, let me get to a summary here. How am I doing? I still got seven minutes. Oh, wait a minute. Jumped ahead again. Don't look at my polar bears. So, <laughs> so there's a pretty good chance that cooler global temperatures are ahead. By the way, nobody can predict temperatures on Earth, I submit. We have been in a warming period. But we now have some situations. Uh, our temperatures in the US are very much determined about what happens on the oceans on each side. And there are, there are natural temperature cycles in the Pacific Ocean called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, a natural temperature rise and fall in the Atlantic called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. Those are both moving into cool phases. And we also have a less active sun. Talk about it in the first two books. Uh, sunspots appear to influence temperatures on Earth. And you've got, you got to track that through. But, uh, so there's, it's very likely that we're going to go into a decade or two of cooling temperatures for a period of time. And I have good news to you, for you about global warming today. Global warming is dominated by natural factors. We've only had a 1.8 degree Fahrenheit rise in the last 140 years. We've had at least four times in the last 10,000 when Earth was naturally warmer. Water vapor is Earth's dominant greenhouse gas. Humans are responsible for only about one or two parts of Earth's greenhouse effect. There is no regulation that Congress can pass that will stop the oceans from rising. There's no law that the state of Michigan that can pass that will make the storms less frequent or less severe. Because climate change is dominated by natural factors, thousands of laws across hundreds of nations are unlikely to have a measurable difference on global temperatures. Fun uh, view graph here. This is a number of years ago. The woman on the left was the head of the Department of Meteorology and Climate Science at San Jose State University. The guy on the right was one of her scholars. If you look closely, you can see she's holding a match under my second book, The Mad, Mad, Mad World of Climatism. The, the colleges can't stand the idea that climate could be dominated by natural factors. So, um, you know, if your kids are in school, this would be a good, good thing for the, them to read, a high school or a smart seventh or eighth grader. I also like to come back and do a college debate. I did a small one at Grand Valley State a few years ago. Uh, this is a, uh, something I did in Northern Iowa with Dr. Jerry Schnorr of the University of Iowa. Uh, talk about energy, talk about climate, get the facts out. And if this thing will advance. <laughs> ah, oh, too much. Anyway, that's it. Thanks very much. It's been an honor to speak to you. And then. Um, I look forward to your questions and challenges. Next speaker is excellent also, and I'm going to challenge you. I don't want anybody to leave here tonight unless you already have all of his books and all the stuff from the Mackinac Center. Before you leave, and even if you leave early, stop back and see Jason. Get his materials. They're all free, so if you're Dutch, you shouldn't have a problem with that. <laughs> Steve's stuff isn't free, but it's worth every penny of it. And if you don't have Steve's books, you need to have them. You should have all of them, but at least get one of them. And I have a bias, the one I think I would recommend, and it's the one with the polar bears on the cover. It's fun to read. Your kids will like it, and you will also. But don't leave here tonight without stopping back at their tables and getting their stuff. Because the goal of the Patriot Skin is to educate and activate. What we're challenging you to do tonight is learn more. You can't talk to your kids or your neighbors or your pastor or anybody about this stuff until you understand it better. And my guess is, like most of your kids, you've been propagandized for 20 years. I graduated my undergraduate degree from Grand Valley. I was excited about ecology. Since then, 
I've read a lot. I've studied a lot. And I want my tuition back. <laughs> because they were not giving me factual, truthful information. Now, at the time, they might not have known any better. It was the early days of the environmental movement. And we'd read Francis Moore Lappy's book, Diet for a Small Planet, and so we're all supposed to be vegetarians. I even tried it for a while, lost some weight. Uh, but uh, the reality is, this has been going on for a while. I'm 73, and this has been going on since 19, the early 70s. We have been propagandized as a nation for a long time. And these policies would be laughable except they're going to take every tax dollar we have and a whole bunch that we don't and print money, and someday we're going to need that money for things we really need, like fix the damn roads. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a Baptist church. But we won't have that money. So public policy makes a difference, but public policy is downstream from the culture. And the culture is shaping us right now. You have to fight back by becoming educated and then educate others. So don't leave tonight without stopping back at those tables. I'll be taking, I'll be taking notes. I'll be writing names. Don't leave without getting their stuff. Jason's is free. Steve's isn't. You need to get both their stuff. Our next speaker, Mr. Jason Hayes, has been here before. He is the director of the environmental policy for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. He's also on the adjunct, facu adjunct faculty member teaching environmental science at Northwood University. And he's been an advisor to the Heartland Institute on Energy and Environmental Policies. He has a master's degree in environmental science from the University of Calgary and a bachelor's degree in natural science and natural resource conservation from the University of British Columbia. Both these guys have more extensive uh, resumes, but I'm not going to get all that stuff. Get their materials. You can see all their accolades and resources and background. These guys are great. You have two world-class speakers here tonight. Pay attention. We will have this on our website. Uh, Jason's stuff, not a problem. And Steve is going to, we're going to have to edit it a little bit because some of it's proprietary stuff, but he's been very gracious. If you wait a little bit, we will have these presentations for the most part on our uh, website. So if, if you've got other people you want to share this with, we'll have it up shortly. Without further ado, Mr. Jason Hayes. it while I was uh, trying to set up the computer. So, alrighty. Hey, Brown, give him an extra five minutes. He's got a little bit more material. It's telling me it's connected to sound booth two, so. Excellent. All right, so thank you to Steve and to the group here for inviting me to speak. Um, as we've already heard, my job here today is to kind of build on what Steve has already done and tie it closer to Michigan for you. Um, so I'm going to speak on seven principles of sound energy policy. And 
on the document that I'm referring to is actually on the back table there, so you're welcome to pick up a copy. Um, so all of the stuff is free, not because it's not worth anything, but because generous people have donated a lot of their hard effort and funds to make it possible for me to be here. So there are people who have already done the work to help uh, make that stuff available to you. So, sound energy policy. Oh no, my, my uh, thing's gonna do the same as Steve's did, okay. There we go. Okay, so what is the Mackinac Center and what is it that we are trying to accomplish? So you folks will know, living in Michigan, that Michigan is home to uh, a wide variety of unique natural features. Uh, my job with the Mackinac Center is to make sure that those unique natural features are recognized and then also to say that we want to make sure that you folks have access to those natural features and that you all recognize that it's possible to have both a clean environment and a strong economy. So it's something that we can do because a lot of the environmental groups and that sort of thing will tell you that we need to shut down or stop using the, the resources that we have from our natural environment and that's actually not true. So my job is to kind of cover these issues and then the Mackinac Center is a Michigan focused um, free market think tank. So we come up with ideas about how free markets can solve policy challenges. So I deal in energy and environment. Okay, so we're gonna talk about seven principles of sound energy policy. The first one is that energy is absolutely essential to each one of you and the rest of us in the state and people around the world living a productive, healthy life. So for human flourishing, if you want to have healthy, uh, happy people, energy is directly uh, connected or linked to a good quality of life, economic prosperity, and environmental improvement. So people will often say, oh, well, using energy, you know, using nuclear fuels, using natural gas, using even coal uh, is necessarily destructive. But the reality is that if you have access to abundant, affordable, reliable, safe energy, you are far more likely to lead a healthy, happy life. Far more likely to be economically prosperous, to be well off, and then also uh, you're much more likely to live in a clean environment because the wealthiest nations on the planet have the cleanest air and the cleanest water, the healthiest wildlife populations and all that sort of thing. Globally, there's about a billion people who don't have access to that reliable, affordable energy. Also globally, there's about three billion, about 40% of the human population that does not have access to a constant supply of reliable energy. So they get it and then it goes away, and they get it and it goes away. Um, they still rely on what's called solid biomass to heat their homes and cook their food. So they literally have to go out and collect firewood or animal dung like cow manure, dry it out and burn that in their house to heat their, their food. So crop residues, they have to use those kind of things to be able to heat their home. Okay, so this is just a graphical representation of it. You can see that actually people without access to electricity is going down, which is a good thing. The numbers are going down. But the majority of people who don't have access to that uh, reliable, abundant electricity are living in the sub-Saharan sub Africa or in South Asia, East Asia, and the Pacific, those regions. But we also have the same sort of thing even here. I've written about uh, people on the Navajo Nation in a region of the Four Corners. There's elders there on the Navajo Reservation who still do not have electricity in their house. Still don't have running water. They live like people did back in the 1800s. So it's not that far away from us. And you can see because of things that happened in February, uh, things that have happened uh, in other areas of the country, we deal with those things or could very quickly deal with those same things. 
Now, when people don't have access to abundant, affordable, reliable electricity, they will go out of their way to find it. So what you see here is, for example, the little kid in the top right-hand corner is literally doing what's called hooking in Pakistan and India. He's throwing a cable out onto a distribution line that is running right by his apartment. So how many of us would be willing to do that? Because you see what happens when people touch electrical lines in the left hand on the bottom. That's one of the, another part of the video. That guy actually is well known in his area for going out and hooking, like literally laying lines on top of distribution lines to get electricity. So there's an excellent movie, a documentary that was produced by a fellow named Robert Bryce. It's called Juice, the, the movie. Robert talks about how people in India don't have access to this electricity and they will do this sort of thing. He interviewed a utility executive from an Indian utility and that Indian utility executive said that as much as 45% of the electricity that his company produces is stolen using this hooking technique. So you can see all the lines, people like literally climbing up on ladders into utility lines to be able to get electricity for their home. That gives you just a bit of an idea how important it is for people to have access to electricity if they are willing to do that. You also get an idea, look at the difference between America at night, satellite photo looking down on the country, the developed areas, and then compare it to North Korea. You can see South Korea is lit up, bright. The only place that's lit up in North Korea is Pyongyang, the place where all the important people live. So the average person lives in a state of abject poverty, energy poverty, they don't have access to electricity. So we understand it's important for uh, human flourishing, but another thing that you often hear is people will tell you, oh, well, green energy, doesn't impact the environment, or we should go to wind or solar because it doesn't have an environmental impact. Well, these are some of the impacts of the choices that we're making today. Now, we get away with it because what we're doing is we're offshoring our environmental impacts. We're sending those impacts to other nations. So what you have is in places like the Congo that have some of the world's best resources of things like cobalt, which we need for the batteries that we're putting into our EVs and the batteries that we're trying to build to do, pardon me, for our utilities uh, to build battery storage and that sort of thing. We need that cobalt, okay? Well, one of the other challenges, not only environmental, because you can see they're not concerned about the environment right there, but the other thing is, if you look at, guess that kid's nine years old, they have kids seven, eight, and nine years old going down into unsupported tunnels to mine cobalt so we can have batteries for our phones. So if we were doing that mining in the United States, it would be done under strict environmental regulations, strict human rights uh, requirements, and strict labor requirements. So how many of you here would say, well, it's okay for a seven-year-old kid to mine cobalt in an unsupported mine shaft so that I can have an iPhone? Right. So other forms of energy impacts. This is a, a picture of Batao, China. Again, looking at the environmental regulations. We get most of the rare earth minerals that we need for the batteries that go into our EVs or our utility battery storage. Most of these rare earth minerals are also required for um, the colors in our phones, in our computers, all of that sort of thing. They go into the batteries, or sorry, the magnets that go into wind turbines. All of these things are essential. We need those rare earth minerals if we're gonna live using the technology that we have become accustomed to. But because China does not have the same level of environmental regulation as we do, they're okay to literally, you can see the pipe in the left-hand corner they refine the, the minerals and the toxic waste from that refinery just gets 
spilled out into the surface. That area used to be a farming uh, community in just on the border of Mongolia in China. But if you Google it, you'll see Batao, China. It's now a toxic wasteland. So again, we're just offshoring that environmental impact because we're still taking those batteries and that sort of thing and stroking ourselves on the back and saying, look, aren't we good, aren't we green? But there are real environmental impacts associated with the choices that we're making. That should be included in the calculus. At the same time, we've heard similar arguments made that, oh, the only way you can afford to make cotton is slavery. That's garbage. But we're making the same arguments, saying the only way we can afford to make solar panels, well, it's okay to imprison and make Uyghur Muslims into slaves. That's grotesque. But yet, as much as the 45% of the polysilicon that goes into making solar panels that come out of China, they're being made in the Xinjiang region, which is home to these prison camps. So again, are we doing the, the proper calculus for the decisions that we're making? Is it worthwhile to use solar panels that were made by slave labor? They, they keep talking about forced labor. The reality is it's slavery. It's not forced labor. Is it okay to do that because it gives us less expensive green electricity? I would argue no. Same sort of thing. Let's look at the environmental impacts of the choices that we're making. This is literally cutting down acres and acres of three to 500 year old Joshua trees, cutting them down and shredding them so that we can put up solar panels in California. Is that a good option? Probably not. Okay, closer to home. This is uh, a proposal by ESA Solar in the area around, um, uh, it's Blissfield, there we go, Blissfield and Adrian. So each one of the little squares kind of uh, still uh, not quite colored in, each one of those is a farm homestead. So ESA Solar wants to cover over, I believe it's 10 square miles of some of the, the richest, most productive farmland in the state of Michigan to be able to uh, make money selling solar. So, and remember that when we do that, there's a, a fellow named uh, Michael Schellenberger who publishes regularly in Forbes magazine. He uh, runs a, a group called Environmental Progress. He actually ran against Gavin Newsom, lost in the, the run for California governor, but his group produced this uh, research that said, for every unit of energy produced, solar produces 300 times more pollution than does nuclear. So when you hear, well, solar is green, it's the best option, we should be doing that. Well, are you actually concerned about the environment? Because if you are, you would choose nuclear. On top of that, if you're concerned about human welfare and well being, like I said, human flourishing earlier, then you would choose nuclear because nuclear runs at what, um, what Steve was talking about before, a much higher capacity factor. Nuclear runs at about 93 to 95% capacity factor. Solar in Michigan runs at 16.2. So during the, the winter, we all know this because it gets cloudy in the winter here. January and February, solar will go down to like a 7% capacity factor. So all forms of energy have environmental and other costs. So wind is well known for doing this to large raptors. So eagles, hawks, budios, that sort of thing. Also in California, they're known for actually taking out California condors, which are still on the endangered species list. So, Mark Mills from the Manhattan Institute has done some excellent work. Google magical thinking, Mark Mills. It's a paper well worth reading. But in a Wall Street Journal article that he wrote a couple of years ago, he said, to give you an idea of what's involved with building one of these wind turbines, one wind turbine, 900 tons of steel, 2,500 tons of concrete, 
and 45 tons of non-recyclable plastic. Solar uses even more. So those are the numbers that we're dealing with. And if we go and implement something like the Green New Deal, we're going to build tens of thousands of them across the country. Okay, continuing in that and building on what Steve said. If we're going to do something like President Biden's green energy transition, we're going to have to rely on industries that don't even exist yet. Um, John Kerry said a couple days ago that 50% of the goals that they have for their energy transition, the technology doesn't even exist yet. We hope we will have it. But, and that's John Kerry, the climate czar that, um, that President Biden has put in place. But if we're worried about environmental impacts, Mark Mills has again said, demand for key minerals such as lithium needs to go up by 4,200%. Graphite uh, needs to go up by 2,500%. Nickel, 1,900%. Rare earth metals, 700%. So again, think back to what I said about Batao, China. We're going to have to multiply that by 700% to be able to start doing this sort of thing. Okay, so remember also, there's a lot of people that use a lot of electricity. Steve gave good numbers for that. So scale is king when it comes to dealing with electricity. So right there, Palisades Nuclear Plant. Very close to home for you folks. It's going to be shut down next year. 800 megawatts of climate-friendly electricity that is going to be gone. So what are you going to do? Like, if you're going to replace that, you need more than 1,400 wind turbines. And remember, I already said 900 pounds of steel, 2,500 pounds of cement, 45 tons of non-recyclable plastic. You're going to need 1,400 wind turbines to just meet the same capacity, nameplate capacity. And remember, as Steve said, 36% capacity factor, so it won't actually do the same thing as that nuclear plant, but it's going next year around this time. They've already said they're shutting it down because Consumers Energy is killing the power purchase agreement for it. Entergy refuses to keep it open. So across the state right now, we have 1,300 wind turbines. So just to replace Palisades, if we were going to do it with wind, we'd have to build all of the wind turbines that we already have in the state plus another 100 or so just to replace that one nuclear plant. Okay, and then when you're done with those wind turbines, what are you going to get? This is about two or 300 wind turbines, the blades from two or 300 wind turbines that are being buried in Wyoming in a landfill. The USGS, the Geological Survey, says that since 2005, we've built 3,000 turbines annually. So where are those 3,000? turbine blades going to go. Right now, they're working on ways to make those blades recyclable, but that just makes the energy situation even more tenuous, because you then have to get up there, take those blades down, ship them to a plant somewhere so that they can be crushed or dissolved or whatever, heated so that they melt. All of those sorts of things have to be done. So now you're making the whole energy situation as related to wind turbines even more tenuous, even more questionable. But again, 3,000 a year since 2005, and we're planning to ramp that up substantially. So I went through and I was thinking, okay, we all live in Michigan. How much land is this going to cover in the state if we try to do this? Like, if we, can we make this work? Well, if we wanted to replace all the fossil and nuclear, that we have in the state with wind, we would have to cover an area that's basically the thumb with wind turbines. So if we're going to do that, is we just ship people out of that area. Like bad acts, you don't need people anymore because we're replacing you with turbines. Okay. The next bit, if you're going to replace it with solar, you could level the entire area of Metro Detroit and pave it with. Okay, occasionally 
occasionally we have to fly out of the Detroit airport. So, <laughs> but anyhow, you would have to cover that much land area just to replace the fossil and nuclear. And that's what we currently have. It's, you know, we're, we're all using more electricity, so that's going to change. But 34, 3,500 square miles of wind turbines in Michigan, or uh, just below, like 920 uh, miles, square miles of solar panels. <coughs> okay, and compare that to just one of our nuclear plants, the Fermi 2 plant, is 1,000 acres. That, that includes everything, like the parking lots and the whole nine yards. 1,000 acres, and it produces 1.1 gigawatts of electricity compared to, like, the average wind turbine is 1.5 megawatts, maybe 2 megawatts. So that just gives you a kind of a comparison of the land that we're dealing with. So we know that we need it uh, to, to really have a flourishing life. We know that it's got to be uh, affordable. We know all of these things, but energy also has to be reliable. Because if we're sitting here and the lights are going on and going off and going on and going off, it doesn't do us any good. And you'll recognize this slide from Steve's presentation. This gives you a picture of what wind generation is like. It's up and it's down, it's up and it's down. That's why wind pairs so well with natural gas. And it's kind of a dirty secret that a lot of the wind developers don't like to talk about because they'll admit in private conversations that wind and natural gas go extremely well together because it's easy to turn on a gas turbine when the wind goes out. They, they ramp up really fast. So gas and wind go together, and a lot of the, the greens will call it the new baseload energy. So they, they actually don't mind, in some cases, gas all that much, but they're trying to find ways to replace gas now with batteries. We already talked about what happens when you're building batteries. Okay, so that previous picture was what it looks like when wind is actually doing what they expect it to. This is a picture, if you can see the green line kind of bumping along the bottom of the graph, that's Washington State in November 2019. Weak solid, their wind produced almost nothing. So what happens if you shut down all your coal, all your nuclear, or if in the case of Washington State, if they listen to the Greens and they knock all their big hydro dams down, what do you do when the wind decides to bump along the bottom of the graph for a week straight? Well, you do the same thing, really, that California did in 2019 and 2020. You go dark. You have blackouts. That's what happens. But so what? I mean, really, so what? That's a first world problem, right? Who cares? We're so well off that if we don't have electricity for an hour or two, what are we griping about? Like I said at the start of the presentation, there's three billion people who don't have access to electricity most of the time. So what are we complaining about, right? That's a first world problem. Or is it? Not really. For a lot of people, it's a life and death situation because when California had its blackouts, people like this guy, um, Robert Mardis, actually died because of it. So this fellow uh, was on one of the oxygen generators and his was plugged into the wall. He knew that a blackout was coming, but when the blackout came, the utility didn't give him like a 10, 15 minute warning, they just shut his power off. Robert was unable to make it across his house to be able to get to his battery powered oxygen generator. He passed out on the floor and died. So is it just a first world problem? Not really. Um, what about Texas? This is what I wrote about in the USA Today. Um, Texas had its power go out for close to a week. And there was a bunch of reasons. Um, yes, renewables played a role, like I said in the article. No, it's not a first world problem because kids like this, Christian Pinatus, froze to death in his trailer, in his bed, with his three-year-old three little brother sitting beside him. His brother survived. But Christian 
didn't. It's not a first world problem. When people don't have access to affordable, reliable electricity, bad things happen. We also need to remember that changing our energy system takes time. These are big systems, like I said, scale matters. And most of these systems, even the, the wind systems, the solar systems last 15, 20 years. Nuclear plants can last 80. Some of them are even getting their license extended out to 100 years. So you're not just like, this isn't like the, the news cycle where you know, we lose interest after 24 hours. These things, when they go in the ground, they cost a lot of money and they last a long time. So as Steve noted in his presentation, we've been subsidizing wind and solar heavily for 20, 30 years. But yet, on a world uh, basis, fossil fuels and nuclear still provide 90% of our total energy demand. That one includes transportation fuels and everything. It's not just electricity. So the US, not that much different. 88% of our total energy use comes from fossil fuels and nuclear. So these are big things, important, and like uh, Steve had noted, in the US, um, wind gives us about three to four percent, and solar about one percent. After 20 plus 30 years of heavy subsidies. So, and our utilities are in on this. They're like going great guns. And one of the big reasons is it's a little phrase called return on equity. Every dollar they spend building a new wind turbine or solar panel, they're guaranteed a dollar ten back. And you guys pay for it. So that's been approved by the state, by the Michigan Public Service Commission. It's not unusual. Pretty much every utility gets that. But every time they tear down a coal plant and build a wind turbine, they are guaranteed 10%. That's what happens. So also recognize that they're planning 20 years out. Like I said, it's a big system and there's a long time frames involved in this. So part of their goals now, uh, and again, building on what Steve had said, most of these utilities back in the day used to be interested in providing their customers with affordable, reliable energy at a decent price. Today, consumers' energy is uniquely positioned to act as a driving force for good. Okay. Not necessarily all that interested in providing affordable, reliable electricity. They're now a driving force for good. Running a clean and lean energy company. This is their plan. This is what they're going to do over the next 20 years. So you can see the little squares at the bottom. Purple is nuclear. Nuclear, sorry, I pulled a George Bush there. Nuclear, um, red is coal, and blue is natural gas. So they're going to next year close down the Palisades plant. They're going to, in the following years, close down the Carn 1 and Carn 2 plants so by Bay City. Then they're going to kill off their power purchase agreement for the Midland Cogen Venture, which is in Midland. That represents about half of their natural gas powered capacity. And then they're going to close down Campbell 1 and 2, Carn 3 and 4, and Campbell 3. All of their coal, all of their nuclear, and about half of the, the capacity for their natural gas is going to be gone by 2040. Their plan to replace it is solar. 6.35 gigawatts of solar they're going to build when they shut down about 4,000. Yes, exactly. Uh, so anyhow. That's their big plan, is some wind, mostly solar, demand response, and energy efficiency. And so, to put that into English, Consumers Energy's plan will try to meet 90% of their customers' uh, requirements, energy needs, with renewable energy, energy efficiency, like switching out your old fridge for a new, more efficient fridge, uh, incandescent lights for LED lights, that's energy efficiency, energy storage, which is the batteries we already talked about, renewable energy, uh, and demand response by 2040. So every one of you here, whether you know it or not, knows what demand response is. How many of you were here in January 2019 when the polar vortex hit? 
How many of you got this text message? Due to extreme temps, consumers ask everyone to lower their heat to 65 degrees or less. Yes, so you now know what demand response is. Stop using energy. That's demand response. That's part of their plan to provide reliable electricity to the state of Michigan. It's reliable because you're not using it anymore, so their system didn't crash. That's demand response. During January 2019, when this was going on, wind was providing 3.8% of the electricity that we were using in the state. So when we were getting notes telling us we need to stop using energy, okay, we were getting pretty close to like 85% of our electricity from what? Yes. Coal? I heard somebody else say natural gas. And nuclear. Right. So the reason that we didn't repeat or, or lead Texas in 2019 is because we still had coal, natural gas, and nuclear. So one of the big reasons that Texas's increasingly fragile system failed in February is because over the past decade, they focused on shutting down coal, building wind. That's pretty much what they dealt with. And then at the same time, they didn't winterize. They weren't ready for cold weather. And the funny thing about Texas is everybody expected what happened then to happen in July or August. They didn't think that it was going to be cold weather that shut down their system. They thought it was going to be hot weather. That's what they normally get. They figured demand for air conditioning was going to shut down their system, not demand for heating. So, but, I mean, the, the other big, it's, it's, not, it's funny, but it's not. It's, they, um, part of the reason why they had problems with their natural gas supply is because about 10 years ago, they forced the, the ERCOT, their, their system manager, forced natural gas and also the state of Texas, forced natural gas producers to switch the pumps that push natural gas through the pipes to the area where it's supposed to go. They forced them to shut, switch those pumps from running on the natural gas that they were producing to electricity. And then when ERCOT imposed the rolling blackouts, they blacked out the pumps that were pushing gas to the areas that they needed. So they no longer had the gas moving through the pipes. I wonder why they ran out of gas. That was part of the problem. So, okay, six, I'm almost out of time here. Six, energy has to be affordable to be useful. Okay, going back to Michael Schellenberger, we've already talked about how unreliable ener uh, renewable energy is. That unreliability, as Steve noted in his presentation, means you have to build backup, backing. So you basically end up building your system twice. You have to have natural gas. You have to have um, the wind and solar. Okay, so you're building your system twice. You're building a whole bunch extra of the, um, the, the, just the entire infrastructure. And so that's starting to hit us today in Michigan right now. So you will have all gotten the emails or mail outs or something like that that said from June to the end of September, from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m., your electricity went up. One, it's now at one and a half times what it was before. So half again on top of the price that you used to pay if you want to run your dryer from 2 to 7 p.m. between June and September. That's hitting us right now. Exactly. Okay, and it's not limited to electricity. It's also line five and the propane that heats a lot of the homes north of the knuckle and in the UP. So Governor Whitmer is trying to shut down the line five pipeline. And so I wrote about this in National Review and on Reason uh, over the past couple weeks. But restricting that energy supply is expensive and dangerous. We know that because we've now heard for the last hour plus. And back on the table there is a policy brief that I wrote with a fellow from Minnesota, Isaac Orr at Center of the American Experiment. Um, 
we looked at the costs of what it was going to take to shut down Line 5. And just one example is that UP residents would need to spend $5,000 on electricity bills to provide similar heating. So they already paid some for propane, so let's take that out. They're still going to spend $3,400 to $3,900 additional each year. $295 to about $325 a month because Governor Whitmer wants to electrify their house. Rip out, spend $20,000 to $25,000 on new appliances because you're ripping out your propane heaters, your stove, all that sort of stuff, and installing a heat pump and um, baseboard heating. $20,000 to replace the appliances and then $300 a month extra for the electricity in the UP. So the last one, energy subsidies harm more than they help. This gives you an idea from 2010 to 2019. The folks at uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation wrote a paper that explained that over that 10-year period, wind got about $37 billion in subsidies from the federal government. Solar got $34 billion. Nuclear, nuclear, I don't know why I can't say that today, $15 billion. Coal, $10 billion. Oil and gas, five. Okay? Now let's go back to a thing that we looked at before. We're giving $70 billion to wind and solar so they can produce about 35 to 4% of our electricity. Now, if, if we have to subsidize things, we, we argue strongly, get rid of the subsidies, period, full stop. I don't care if it's for gas, if it's for coal, if it's for nuclear, if it's for re renewables, I don't care. Get rid of it. Compete on a flat, open playing field. Okay? But if you have to, like the world's going to end if we don't subsidize something. Why would we not subsidize natural gas and nuclear? Which are, natural gas is the reason that the United States, from fuel switching from coal to gas, has dropped its CO2 emissions by 25% since 2005. So clearly, it's a clean option. We know nuclear doesn't produce any CO2. So why don't we do that? So we'll end off. I won't go through these seven principles because I'm past my time. Again, you can get this publication, The Seven Principles of Sound Energy Policy, on the table back there. But with that, I'll say thank you, and I'm open to questions and whatever. We're going to get ready for Q&A. The gentleman will answer a lot of your questions here shortly. Uh, just a reminder, uh, uh, freedom isn't free. Uh, we're a grassroots group. George Soros n never sent us a check, and I don't think he's going to now after he hears this presentation. So we take a free will donation at every meeting, and uh, we appreciate any support you can give us. We've spent a lot lately. We spent a thousand dollars of our uh, reserve budget just to ensure that our website is secure. We're moving that to a very secure site. And we we'll spend another $1,200 to maintain that. And so we have expenses. Um, and our goal is to pretty much keep giving you solid information. And so give what you can. Uh, this is our last regular meeting until September. But we will have our annual uh, meeting for members in June on the 10th with Justin Barkley as our keynote. So uh, we encourage you, become a member. Uh, you can see Jeff at the table and sign up tonight. Or if you have the program, on the back of the program is our membership form. Fill it out, mail it in. We'd be glad to have you join us. In numbers of strength, and some of these horror stories you see with the governor don't have to happen. You need to get involved with a group like ours or some other group of your own choosing. You've got to become active because complacency and trying to hide from this stuff isn't going to work. They're coming for you. When they charge another three to ten grand for your electric bill, how are you going to deal with that? The only way to stop that is enough of us have to stand up and say no more. And there's lots of ways to do that. And if you get involved with us, we'll show you how and introduce you to other groups. But a lot of people have been complacent for too long. 40% of Christians didn't vote in the last election. That can't happen again.
look at the mess we got because of that. So get involved. Uh, Steve and Jason will be answering some of your questions now. Uh, we have, uh, do we have mics we can circulate with? Yeah. And um, we'll have a couple people circulating around with microphones. And if you raise your hand, we'll call on you and then try to answer your questions. And don't forget, before you leave, stop back, say hi to Steve and Jason, get the stuff on Jason's table, and get at least one of Steve's books. Educate yourself and your family because it's not just a good thing to do, it's essential for your survival. But by the way, we're going to start emergency preparation classes for the Patriots starting in September. Uh, in light of all the things that we're looking at, it might be a useful idea to be prepared for unforeseen emergencies because we may have some man-made ones in the very near future. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started here. Uh, Bram, does we, did we get the microphone to one of our folks that can circulate it? I'll do it. But uh, so Steve and Jason can come up, use the microphone and the lavaliers if you want, and we'll start generating questions. Et cetera, to uh, make them a little more knowledgeable about what's really going on? I, no, they're not. I've not uh, been in to speak for Congress. I've done a little bit at the state level. There are some other really good people, though, that, that do come in. Mark Mills was mentioned in both of our presentations. He goes there and talks to them as well. Um, uh, a guy I consider an advisor, William Happer, an atmospheric scientist. Steve, that talk into the mic. We'll oh. get you a lavalier because it's Sorry. trying to get a good sound back. Uh, William Happer, an atm atmospheric science scientist at Princeton University, is a real good guy, um, and he's uh, part of a group that that uh, talks about how CO2 is not a problem and an issue. And uh, unfortunately, he was in the Trump administration for a while and couldn't get any traction. He had a couple people there that were that were supporting him, but overall, there wasn't a way to really change policy beyond what they had. So, uh, yeah, we have a significant problem now. Ultimately, what we need to do is is get rid of the endangerment finding by the, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, which was done in uh, 2009, which says carbon dioxide is a pollutant and endangering health of citizens. That's, that's the thing that really needs to be overturned. It depends. Like, uh, for us, uh, so the Mackinac Center and other state-based think tanks have gone and given presentations in D.C. to congressional staffers. So. They, there are some of them that are willing to listen. Um, and I mean, honestly, the staffers are the people that give the information that a lot of the, the members will say on the floor. So the members rely on the staffers to write their speeches and that sort of thing. So it is still worth it to talk to staffers. And then um, one thing I forgot to say is make sure if you take nothing else from the desk back there, pick up one of these. It's uh, about Opportunity Michigan. We will email you from the Mackinac Center to let you know, here's an important issue that you could be involved in. Um, here's a way that you can get involved and get educated about uh, situations. The Mackinac Center will give you alerts when there's something important that's going to hurt your pocketbook, and then you can call your legislators and talk to them about it. Yeah. Other questions? Yep. yep. Let me get the mic. We're, we're trying to tape this, so we want everybody to talk into the microphone. Um, obviously, they think they are correct. What is the drive that is pushing them, not just other states, but other countries around the world, to want to change the sources of our sources of energy for people? What is behind the drive of this? Economics? Well, uh, I mean, think of any of the, the kids that you folks know, if they are taught in a public school, they have this information drilled into their head from day one. So a lot of people seriously believe that climate change is going to end the world in 10 years. 
Okay. They get, they're, they're being taught that. Um, okay, the, I mean, you can uh, say one of the, one of the things that Christi Christina, sorry, Christina Figueres from the UN said very clearly, the thing that drives this is the transfer of wealth. So that was, uh, I mean, straight from the horse's mouth, at the UN, she is one of the main climate people at the UN. So, I, I really believe the world jumped to a conclusion. Back in 1988, uh, the Senate held hearings. Al Gore came, and they, they brought Dr. James Hansen of NASA in front. He said he was 99% sure the Earth was warming, humans were causing it. A year later, the United Nations was formed. And in 1992, they had the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit only three years later, and 46 nations and the European Union signed a treaty saying they would reduce greenhouse gases. It was a very sudden decision. And uh, for, and now for the last 30 years, they've been arguing about how much to reduce emissions and, and when, and the, and, but the evidence really doesn't support the effort. There were also, there, are, there are, have been groups that have used the theory of man-made warming to pursue other ends. The United Nations is one of those. Uh, they've had three big ob objectives for many years. Uh, one was to reduce what they call overconsumption and overproduction. They think we're consuming too much, particularly in the United States and Europe. And uh, global warming is a great way to reduce that. Uh, they wanted to redistribute wealth from the, the wealthy nations to the poor nations. They've called for a $100 billion climate fund, $100 billion to be transferred every year. And they wanted one world government. All those things were, were objectives that were supported and aimed for these Plus, we have wind, solar, biofuels. A lot of industry have sprung up. We have some nations like the UK and Germany that want to be environmental leaders. And so there's kind of a, a, a coalition of forces that has grown up. But the bottom line is uh, people are going to learn the hard way about this. They're going to learn with rising energy costs, intermittent energy, and a lot of other problems. Uh, and I, I, I think that's going to take painful lessons before, uh, before the tide is turned again. It's very typical for uh, scallywags and scoundrels to uh, clothe themselves in the environmental movement. It's no accident that Mikhail Gorbachev and communists love the environmental movement because they can do that by saying we're just out to do good to the world, and they're trying to do what the communists always try to do, power, control, totalitarian rule, and they can use the environmental movement because Steve mentioned the UN they're saying we can't solve this problem just by individual nation states, so we have to have a, a, a world power to control it. That's where the UN comes in. There's a lot of money involved, too. A, 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 a climate modeling team costs, with a supercomputer costs $50 million to set up, $20 million a year to run. There are about 30 of those teams around the world, and they keep push, pushing for more and more. And it's really sad, the climate scientists, they know that storms aren't getting stronger, but that is never challenged. Scientists that are climate uh, scientists or modelers don't go to the press and say, this is just wrong, we're not seeing stronger storms, even though the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said there isn't evidence that the stro storms are getting stronger. That is just never challenged. So it's, it's really a sad situation in many ways. Um, we got here a little late, so I'm sorry if you addressed this. Um, how does what you talked about earlier, um, Mr. Gorham, affect um, our military and the use of all this electronic or electric cars and electric vehicles? Sounds terrifying. Well, that's so another sad thing. Uh, yeah. in, in the Obama administration, the Navy spent, uh, I'm trying to remember the correct number, I believe it was $100 billion to build a green fleet. Uh, they went out and tried to use biofuels, and they found they went overseas. Nobody could refuel their ships. Uh, they had a, a bunch of things like the destroyers couldn't keep up with the carriers be because of the, of the engines and the fuel they were using. I mean, it is just really remarkable. And there are some videos you can get from the Heartland Institute where some former admirals and officers have spoken about that. But, uh, yeah, we've got, it. We got everybody today following... Uh, President Biden's lead and spouting all this stuff about how climate is a, a threat and enhancer and all sorts of other things. It, uh, it's, it's very, very sad. You want to add something, Jason? I'll say even more importantly, like I discussed the issue of rare earth minerals, 
we need those rare earth minerals to set up and run all of our defense equipment, the GPS systems, the, the screens that the soldiers use to see what's coming in and out and all those sorts of things. They all rely on rare earth minerals and China controls 95% plus of the world market in refining rare earth minerals. So heaven forbid if China ever decided to push on issues like Taiwan or, or those sorts of things, the, the islands that they're building in the, the, just off their coast, yeah, in the South China Sea, um, then if we decide that we want to stop that, we still have to hope that they will sell us rare earth minerals to make the weapons that we would be using to defend our allies against those aggressions. Other questions? I don't know if you ever you've thought of this, but um, seems to me in order for renewable energies to be able to be utilized by everybody would be if you were to reduce the population by about 65, 70%. I just wondered what your thoughts are on that. Well, popu population is kind of a, a hidden issue. I talk about it in my uh, last book, The uh, uh, Outside the Green Box, Rethinking Sustainable Development. There are four big drivers of the environmental movement today. One is overpopulation, although it's kind of a hidden sort of a thing, but people think we have too many people. Another is global pollution. Then there's climate destruction and resource depletion. If you look at all four of those, they really aren't a problem today. Po global population. Uh, fertility rates are down by 50% since 1960. Gr just about every nation in the world except some nations in Africa. And so we're getting to a point where global population is going to go to zero very, very soon. And there are many nations now that are very concerned about this, supporting the older generation. So population is kind of a hidden issue, um, but it, it is a driver of a lot of different things. Yeah, one, one example of what is being discussed. There's a movie that came out last year at about this time by Michael Moore, the Michael Moore, and uh, Jeff Gibbs, his compatriot. They actually did an extremely good job of critiquing the renewable energy industry. The area where that movie or documentary failed is because the majority of their concern is based in the notion that there are too many people on the planet and that the only reason it's bad to use renewable energy is because it, it continues the lifestyle that we're leading. So this idea that they're fooling people to think that we can still continue living the way we do by using renewable energy. So that was, there was one good aspect to the movie, but the movie is called Planet of the Humans. And um, it's, it's on like YouTube and, and that sort of thing. It's actually worth watching, but uh, yeah, their primary concern is that there's too many people. And so their, 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 I guess, solution is the same sort of solution that was offered by people like Paul Ehrlich in the population bomb and others like them is, like when I took uh, environmental ethics courses, I was taught by different uh, authors in that, that the only truly sustainable human population is 500 million. So we would always ask, okay, well, what about the other seven billion? So. I didn't, I didn't talk much about pollution to, today, Jason did, but there are yeah. absolutely great trends. In all of the wealthy nations of the world, air pollution is down a, a lot from the 1980s. Water pollution is improving all over the world. The Rhine River, the Dan Danube River, everything else. Wealthy societies are cleaning up their pollution. We have another factor as well. Agriculture is just a tremendous success. Uh, Land use for agriculture and pasture is down, has been declining since the year 2000. It peaked in the year 2000, even though population is still going up. Farmers can grow so much nowadays. Uh, they're so productive, they don't need to put as much land into, it doesn't pay to put the land into production. We have a situation with water. Uh, two billion people had got access to, to fresh water in the last three decades. They say there's water shortages all over, but that problem's being solved. So there's an awful lot of good news and the overpopulationists just ignore all that sort of stuff. And they say, we got all these problems, but people really need to know pollution is declining. Uh, we're giving land back to nature from agriculture. 
and we are, you know, the water, we can go desell the oceans and, and get all the water we want. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, this question's for Jason. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the renewables presentation. It was very good. Uh, regarding Line 5, particularly, uh, yes, we need the, uh, the energy from Line 5. Uh, I don't think anyone would argue that. However, personally, I think that the risks are too high to keep it operating at this time uh, to avoid uh, environmental impact to lakes should it fail. Um, however, I'm, I'm hearing, and maybe you can share with this light this a little further, what's happening in the background to uh, replace Line 5. We're talk I'm hearing tunnels, maybe a tunnel by 2024, but uh, that, that news, that information is kind of dried up. Do you, can you share a little more on that subject? Yeah, I'd go to our website, Mackinac.org, and you'll see a bunch of things that I've written about it. But the short version is, yes, there is a plan to remove it from the waters of the Great Lakes because, yeah, nobody wants a spill in the Great Lakes. Um, I mean, literally nobody wants. Uh, so the, the, the plan is the alternative that was selected when the state government did a report during the Snyder regime uh, was, uh, the, sorry, the Snyder administ administration. That was inappropriate. Um, so any, uh, I apologize for that. That wasn't necessary. Um, but during the Snyder administration, they uh, selected an alternatives. They wrote the report and said the alternative that's the best option is drilling a tunnel 100 feet below the bedrock or below the bed of the, the lake and encasing it in cement, removing the pipeline from the waters and putting the pipeline into the tunnel. Good part about that is the waters of the Great Lakes are protected and you get to keep the essential energy infrastructure. So the other part of that is Enbridge has yeah, said they really would do that. It was estimated it would cost $500 million. Enbridge was going to foot the bill for that, N not a, a penny of tax dollar expense. And then at the end of it, when the tunnel was built, they would basically cede it back to the state. It would be managed by uh, Mackinac Tunnel Authority, similar to the Bridge Authority. And so that's, that was all set up and ready to go. And the reason that it's being stalled is because the current administration uh, is litigating to stop it or has litigated to stop it. So if you asked um, Governor Whitmer, she would say, and she has said on numerous occasions, she's okay with Enbridge going through the process of getting the permits. She's totally fine with that. But yet Dana Nessel, on the, well, on her first day in office, Governor Whitmer asked Dana Nessel to uh, do uh, an attorney general opinion of whether or not the law that allows Enbridge to build the tunnel was constitutional. Dana Nessel came back with a report that said, no, it is not constitutional, and all spending or all activity that went on by the state government, the um, DEQ uh, Eagle now, uh, they were no longer allowed to handle the paperwork that was associated with um, dealing with the permits. That has moved on, DEQ and Eagle is now allowed to do that again, and actually, they got pressure last year, in September last year, I think it was, 23 of 51 House Democrats in the, the Michigan House voted along with all of the Republicans in the House and said, House re resolution that said, it's time, go ahead and permit that tunnel as quickly as possible. So it was a bipartisan resolution supported by both Democrats and Republicans in the House. And we have since had uh, testimony in the Senate Energy Committee from unions on both the American side and the Canadian side. We have had uh, business interests, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, the Ohio Chamber of Commerce has come in and said, get the tunnel built as quickly as possible. Uh, there have been elected officials from both parties and from both sides of the, the border have said the same thing. The federal minister of natural resources in Canada said not building the tunnel is a no, it's a non-starter. 
Right, non-negotiable. So it's one of those things that there is broad bipartisan international support for building the tunnel, and yet it's, we're waiting. Uh, it actually, the Public Service Commission has given initial approval to some of the permits. There still are further state permits and also Army Corps of Engineer permits that need to be approved before they can begin actually drilling the holes. Enbridge has spent somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 million doing the initial geological surveys, the drilling and that sort of thing to get prepped for it. But we're just now waiting on the litigation to end because it was May 12th was the date that Governor Whitmer said, you are not allowed, Enbridge, you are not allowed to operate the pipeline beyond May 12th. So Enbridge said, that's not state jurisdiction, that's federal jurisdiction. So Enbridge is still operating the tunnel, or the pipeline, sorry. Uh, the state has responded by saying they're gonna seek all the profits that Enbridge is making while they're operating. So it's a, but fortunately, they are still uh, involved in mediation talks. So Justice Rosen, retired judge who handled the uh, Detroit um, bankruptcy hearings and the mediation, he is in charge of the mediation and both the state and Enbridge are involved in talks and hopefully they will be able to solve it. Again, we're waiting. We'll solve it when we replace Dean and Nessel, who is heavily funded and supported by George Soros. We've got time for a couple more questions. Somebody over here, because we've been over there. There's a gentleman. Question for Steve. Uh, thanks for coming today, by the way. Great to see you. Um, I work in the chemical industry. When we want to do something new, we start at small scale and we scale up and we scale up. We make sure things work at small scale before we go big scale. And here we have the federal government wanting to go big scale right away. I wonder wh why can't we run or should we run the small scale experiment? Take a town the size of, I don't care, Bloomingdale, Michigan, some small town, and try to run it on renewables and show what the real cost is to have a re re reliable grid at some small scale and then publish the results and have everybody see what the real cost is. I look at what's being spent on this effort and it would cost a lot less to run a small experiment and it's prove too, the point. It's too logical. There's not, there's Thank not, you. There's not <laughs> enough panic in there. I mean, if you look at the plan at the, sta the state of New York, for example, they have like 3% uh, wind and solar in their electricity. They want to scale up wind by 20 times and solar by 600 times, spend $100 billion dollars plus transmission costs by 2040 or so, close all these other plants, and then they have the goal to say electricity rates aren't gonna go up. I mean, you know, this stuff is just, it's, uh, it's fantasy. It's beyond any reasonable kind of a thing. Uh, and ideology is so powerful, and everybody's run to sign up, all these utilities, as Jason said, they all get their 10% addition to whatever they build, and they've given up fighting this. They've, they've caved in, very, very sad. And I, I, I hate to give a negative message, but communities are going to have to learn the hard way. When their rates go through the roof and when their, their systems can't provide electricity, they're going to start, start screaming. Um, and uh, California and Texas and Oklahoma are the tip of the iceberg. They had, the same, they had a problem in Colorado, too. They used like 80% uh, of their budget in a month for, for the year with, with expensive electricity, the, the utilities did. So it's, this stuff is going to come home to roost. It's unfortunate. We got time for about three more questions. Any question from this group back here? Okay, see so one up front. This is kind of an economic question. Um, since trillions of dollars are going to be spent, what publicly traded companies will get their hand in the pie? Any of them that are building uh, the wind and solar, like I showed the, the one proposal by ESA Solar, they're planning to build 10 square miles of solar panels uh, near Blissfield and Adrian, covering over some of the most productive farmland in the state. So, yeah, um, and all of them, uh, Entergy, um, and as soon as you ask, of course, my brain is going blank. Uh, the other companies, most of the big utilities are involved in this. So any of 
the, the areas Excel Energy in um, Colorado and Minnesota, um, a lot of <laughs> Consumers Energy, DTE, any of those, those big utilities are definitely going to make money on this energy transition. You can add to that global mining companies, of course. Uh, people providing backup power supplies, that's going to be big, big business. That's big in California and Texas already. And recycling or, or uh, landfilling for uh, wind turbine waste. Uh, Jason talked about that. There are some projections, if you look at these wind turbine build-outs, that wind turbine blade waste is going to be approximately as big as uh, global plastic waste by 2050, and solar cell waste, the same kind of thing. Each of them are likely to be as big as global plastic waste. So recycling a waste and landfill is another big business. <laughs> we're we're going to cut it off here, and Steve and Jason will be back at their tables, happy to answer your questions. Yep get their literature, and make sure to get some of Steve's books. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Don't forget to stop back at their table and get some of their literature and some of their books if you want to be well informed. <laughs>